morning to everyone and good afternoon for the ones who are dialing in closer to my time zone. Uh, my name is Poovan Balasubramaniam, but everybody calls me Poovan. Uh, I am one of the directors and principal engineer at Synergen Oil and Gas. Uh, we are based in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, if people know, and some of you I think have studied in, uh, uh, in Petronas University over here. That's how I met Manga when he came by uh, during the ADIPAC conference and mentioned that I had studied. So that's how we started the conversation. But anyway, I'm actually, I would like to thank the SPE Juba section for inviting me to speak today. I am quite excited and looking forward to actually uh, present to you about Synergen, about what we do, and also to present to you on a topic on uh, process safety management and implementation of process safety management, especially key areas for organizations looking into starting and, and starting to look into implementing uh, PSM within the organizations. Yeah. So thank you very much. Let me start sharing my the slides. So we've got some slides to share with everyone. So a little bit about Synergen Oil and Gas. Uh, about us, we are very much an engineering consultancy. Uh, we take great pride in saying they're very independent, we're agile and highly responsive. And what I mean by highly responsive is we are able to actually deploy and support our clients internationally and worldwide. And that's testament to the type of clients we have. Uh, our clients ranges from uh, the UK, Norway, uh, Europe, to West Africa, to the Middle East, to Southeast Asia, to Japan and also in Australia. So we are quite highly responsive and we are able to deploy during pre-COVID times, people across uh, the globe to meet our clients and support our clients. Uh, less so now during the COVID times, but we have obviously embraced the whole digital uh, technology and, and facilitating a lot of our workshops and talks using Zoom or Microsoft Teams. Uh, key thing about us is very much about highly skilled service provider trying to bridge the gap between design and operations. We have a lot of our team members and engineers who actually come from an engineering background. And also we have a number of people who actually have operations backgrounds. So together, uh, our vision is actually to try to support our clients by bridging the gap, looking at design and operations as well. Now, what we do is very much a specialized type of a consultancy. We are very much focused on process safety and technical risk, which I presume you know. And if you have any questions at the end of the presentation, please feel free to ask. We also have experience in loss prevention, uh, the safety engineering type of work. And that's because of a lot of our members, as I mentioned before, who come from an engineering background. Uh, and then on operational safety, looking at day-to-day -day operational safety from a process safety perspective. And that's what we do for existing operations and clients who already have operating plants. And lastly, we have a training and workshop facilitation that we are doing right now. I'm quite proud to say that we have already, already established a training academy and we have a lot of training modules in, within the realms of uh, process safety that we're now offering and providing to our clients. Uh, our offices, I'm calling you from Kuala Lumpur, that's our main office, but we have expanded quite uh, significantly over the years. We have an office in Jakarta, we have an office in uh, Singapore, uh, we based, we opened an office in Brunei in 2020, we have an office in uh, Yangon and also in Aberdeen because I used to be based in the UK in Aberdeen working in the North Sea and uh, Good news is we're having an office in the Middle East very soon, most likely in Abu Dhabi. Uh, like most consultancies, uh, we have all the ISO certifications in place and we have developed our own uh, integrated management system where we call, which we call SIMS. The value proposition about us, uh, we're very much a go-to consultancy for very impartial and honest advice. And we help a lot of companies not only in the oil and gas, that used to be what we used to do in the beginning when we actually started up the company. But as you know, with the energy transition, what's happening globally, we are also now working with clients more on the alternative energy, like in the power plants and solar sectors as well. Uh, 
technical competency, what I mentioned before, we have a wide range of people with various different exp experience, ranging from engineering all the way to operations. So we feel we are in a unique position where we actually have the right kind of competencies to help our clients with, on different aspects and different issues that they have. And lastly, on productivity, I mean, what we're trying to make sure is to ensure our clients can meet their compliance requirements, uh, keep their people safe, and also quite importantly, increase the asset longevity. The better the operating plants can run, the safer it can be run, the better and more profitable it becomes, and also that will help in the long term to reduce operational costs. A little bit about the co-founders, uh, my colleague, Dr. Keith Bell, uh, who's English, but has been in Asia for what now nearly 22 years. Um, Keith and myself used to work at DMV many years ago, and that's how we know each other. Uh, Keith is a, a very experienced uh, facilitator doing hazard, HAZOP and SIL workshops. Uh, he's also a certified uh, bowtie, uh, bowtie XP trainer, and very much a consequence modeling and formal safety assessment specialist. And what I mean by formal safety assessment specialist is very much a specialist in undertaking all the typical safety studies, like your QRAs, like your consequence modeling, like your escape evacuation studies, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, he was previously with uh, DNB and then moved on with ERM. And prior to forming Synergen, he was actually the uh, technical services uh, GM with Wally Parsons. Uh, myself, I have about 25 years working experience. I'm a professional process safety engineer certified with the ICAMI in the UK. I'm also a Bowtie uh, certified trainer. Uh, I spent a lot of my uh, working years in, in the North Sea, uh, mainly in the UK, but also spending some time in Norway. And I used to work with the with DNB, as I mentioned before, with Keith. And then I moved on into the operation side and I worked with Talisman Energy which became Repsol uh, and, and I think it's being bought over by somebody else right now. And then most recently with Premier Oil, which is a UK independent oil and gas company. Uh, I used to be their process safety lead for their UK operations uh, based out of Aberdeen. And I still have a good relationship with them. So I'm acting now as their process safety technical authority for their offshore FPSO asset in, in Vietnam. Okay. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, a little bit of a core business. So as I mentioned, we're very much a process safety and technical risk type of consultancy. We do all your hazard hazard workshops. We look at uh, your safety critical elements and performance standards. We do things like noise studies, uh, acoustic induced vibration, flow induced vibration, CFD modeling using fluent, and on all the formal safety assessment studies, as I mentioned before your lab studies, design safety, uh, design safety case, and so forth. Uh, for the operational safety side, we do things like your reliability, availability, and maintainability type studies, your Formica type of work, your MOC reviews, uh, you know, technical authority, operational safety case, safety case rollout, and so forth. Yeah. On, on, on the right-hand side, on the loss prevention side, uh, need to let people in. On the right hand side is the loss prevention type of activities like your HSE philosophies, hazardous area classification, uh, fire water analysis. We do steady state and transient using pipe net. Uh, we do escape route layouts. Uh, human factors is something that we are actually now very quite serious moving into at, at present time. And then things like your flare study and fire and gas detection type of work. And something that's unique, as I mentioned, the training academy. That's something we are we're quite proud to have launched this year and something that we've been doing over the last 12 months, to be honest, very seriously over the last 12 months. And we do all the process safety related training like your hazard, hazard, uh, process safety management, bow tie training, that which we do using the CG's bow tie XP software and then things like effective risk assessment as well. So that's briefly just talking about our core services and what we do. We are very much technical aspect, uh, experts in what we do. Uh, we have a good reach with a lot of clients and also we have a 
I would say, I would, I'm proud to say that we have a credible name within the industry. Okay. Uh, a little bit about the training academy. All our training courses are endorsed by an Australian-based registered training organization called COEX. That's something we are looking at, and we are obviously looking at also supplementing this, these basic courses that we have with, with more training courses as we go forward with the, with the launch of the training academy. As I mentioned, we also a, a partner with CG Risk uh, Software who have developed the Bota XP, and a number of our people are actually Bota certified trainers. Uh, as part of the digital revolution, we also have embraced digital uh, within, within our organization. And we have now developed an e safety case uh, platform where we can help our client in order to convert uh, a safety case, which is typically paper based or just as a PDF document. And now we are actually trying to digitalize that so that we have better workforce engagement and workforce involvement in understanding about the contents of the safety case, the barrier management, because effectively it is actually the workforce that are actually essential in order to actually help manage uh, hazards within any facility. So we're trying to uh, increase awareness engagement with, uh, with the workforce by, by, by developing this as a solution for our clients, especially for management in order to have better uh, workforce engagement. Uh, something else we've developed is an action tracking management system. We have done this for a number of clients where you have lots of actions, especially for big projects. You want to be able to manage how actions are being progressed from when they are raised to when they're being addressed to when they're closed out. So this is something that we have actually developed as well in-house. Okay. More about our value offering. Uh, our experience really very much uh, ranges across the entire spectrum. We do things from pre-feed to feed to detailed design work into brownfield modifications to operational support, as I mentioned, for existing operations to some kind of advisory technical authority type of services, right? So we do both greenfield and brownfield, and we actually are working with, uh, with a significant number of clients, both upstream and also in downstream. Uh, these are some of the project experience lists that we have. And I have uh, just listed down some of the projects that we've done in, in Africa, namely in West Africa. Uh, we're quite active with a number of the offshore operators, especially the FPSOs, uh, like uh, BW Offshore and also with uh, Yinson, which is basically the first EMP facility that's uh, been deployed recently in Nigeria. We also have done a lot of work in the UK uh, and we continue to do some work in the UK. We're hoping that we'll be doing some more work this year in the UK as well. And a lot of work in the Middle East. And as you can see, we're quite active in the Middle East, uh, especially in Qatar and also in Abu Dhabi. And we've done quite a number of training for ADNOC as well. And in Abu Dhabi, we did one last year on Hazid and Hazop and LOPA, if I'm not mistaken, and we are hoping that we will carry on doing more training for their people as well in, in Abu Dhabi. Okay, so that was an introduction about Synergen, what we do, our services, our expertise. So it gives you a bit of a flavor about who we are. And the main topic of today's presentation is looking at implementation of process safety management and why is it important. So let's look at why is process um, Ruben, uh, yes uh, apology for interrupt maybe uh can we just uh change the view out of the presenter view so better for them to view it okay the view instead you, of project yeah. yeah you should have told yeah, me you, earlier i would have changed it yeah you press yeah then just hide yeah just hide presenter view hide presenter absolutely view. absolutely sorry i I'm normally seeing using Teams rather than Zoom. So I do apologize. Is this better yeah, now? Yeah. Can everyone see? Uh, no, you have to reshare back. I have to reshare again. Okay, no problem. Mm. Can everyone see this now? Yeah, you just click back. 
resume slideshow. And for some reason, I can't show. You're not seeing. You're not seeing this, right? Mm, no, I'm seeing your. No. Sorry. Is this better? Yeah. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm sharing my other screen now, so you're seeing the other screen. Okay. Okay. This is better, right? Yep. Uh, hold on. But let me see whether I can move it in the screen. Yep. Okay. So why why process safety? Uh, if you look at why process safety, um, there are a significant number of incidents that has occurred uh, globally, and it has occurred over the number of years. And what I mean by that is that there are there is a continuous trend of process safety incident that is that is that is occurring regularly, globally, and there has also been quite a significant incident that's happened in West Africa recently as well. I'm sure you'll know about, about the, the FPSO. So it really shows the importance of why process safety is quite important for the industry and also for organizations, because you can imagine a significant, significant event can really have adverse effect onto any company or any organization in terms of people, in terms of the environment, in terms of the asset damage, and also the reputation, right? So it's quite important, and this is why process safety is something that the industry is taking quite seriously and looking into. So if you think about it, usually people will say, we have always done it this way and nothing has happened before. But that is really isn't a, a very good argument to say, just because it's never happened in your career, it will never happen. Uh, Process safety incident is very different than occupational safety incident because you have to remember occupational safety is more looking at your slips, strips and falls, you know, confined space work where the potential injury is not so severe as compared to a process safety event. And so I like to actually coin the term and think about it as process, occupational safety as uh, high frequency, but low consequence whereas process safety events are uh, very high uh, consequence, but low frequency. If you think about it, if it never happens in your career, you've actually done a very good job. The last thing you want is for something like this to, I need to invite some people in who are trying to get in. Hold on, waiting in the room. Wait. And then wait. Okay. So if you think about it, uh, the process safety events are low frequency events, don't happen very often, sometimes never happen in your career, but the consequence is so significant. So if you think about the Gulf of Mexico incident, the Mukando incident, that actually created significant uh, reputational loss to BP and, and you know with, with liabilities of $50 billion and more, to be honest. So it, it's not many companies that can actually absorb that type of losses and process safety event can actually make a company go bust and be out of business. So this is now becoming very important why process safety is becoming more and more important uh, within the energy industry. Okay. Uh, little bit about some statements made by some very important people. Uh, Professor, Andrew Hopkins said that just because the fact that you've gone 20 years without a catastrophic incident is no guarantee that there won't be one tomorrow. So that's something very important to remember. Just because it's not happened before, doesn't mean it won't happen. Uh, you have to look from historical information. You have to actually look at what else is happening elsewhere. And that's how you actually have a precursor. And that's why you should really look at lessons learned, look at previous incidents and other incidents that's occurred so that you can take some of the lessons learned and implement that within your organization. Yeah. You know, Dr. Trevor Klatz also said that, you know, if you think safety is expensive, and I know some of you may be working in the safety realms or safety within your, within your organization, and sometimes you are having discussions in management and they always will say a safety initiative or a safety measure is too expensive. But really, I mean, 
if you think safety is expensive, try an accident. And accidents, as I mentioned, can cost a lot of money, not only in damage, but also can actually affect the company's reputation. Okay. Uh, so as part of that, the industry has gone through a bit of a rethink. And over the years, predominantly, especially after the Piper, uh, after the Bhopal incident, really. Uh, so after the Bhopal incident really prompted the industry to actually have a rethink about how they're managing process safety related type of uh, accidents or major hazards, as they call it. And this came about with the creation of the PSM program in, in 1992. And that's morphed as well. And it moved on into the OSHA PSM program that you now you have or the CCPS, uh, Risk-Based Process Safety, or the Energy Institute's uh, Process Safety uh, Management, which, are, you know, which has a number of elements as well. And we'll be looking at the Energy Institute's uh, PSM framework. We'll be focusing a bit on that because it's quite an easy thing, I feel, for you to follow. And let's go on to the next slide. So what is PSM? Uh, PSM is really very much a structured set of guidelines. And what you want to do is to manage, it's really about managing your hazards associated with processes using highly framed hazardous chemicals to help assure safe and helpful workplaces. That's basically what it is. It's managing high risk uh, processes and high risk uh, chemicals that you're actually using as part of your process. But at the core, it's actually emphasizing proactive management of hazards rather than reactive managing of hazards. And a lot of, a lot of companies over the years, historically, has been very reactive rather than proactive. And, and process safety management is about driving and changing that focus from being reactive to being more proactive. Right? It also introduces a risk-based approach uh, towards managing hazards and helps to identify and prioritize your high risk hazards because you will have a risk of, you know, you'll have various different types of hazards within your facility or within your organization. You can help to prioritize that. Therefore, then the focus and effort that you put in will be more on the higher risk rather than the lower risk. If you look at PSF, the best thing you can do is to try to visualize this as a building and is supported by four primary pillars. And the pillars actually consist of process safety culture being the first pillar, then identify and assessing the risk as the second pillar, to managing of risk as the third pillar, and then lastly, review and improve, which is the last pillar. So we'll look at all these, uh, all these pillars and the elements within these pillars, and we'll be presenting about some of the, what we think are the minimum, minimum requirements that most organizations should be looking at when you're considering implementing PSM, right? Uh, if you can do all of them, even better, but sometimes maybe you need to start small before you can go into implementing the entire, the entire framework. So these are the 20 uh, elements within the Energy Institute's PSM framework. The, the green colors, there are five elements under process safety culture. There are two elements under identification and assessing the risk. There are 11 elements under managing the risk and two under review and improve. Okay. So let's look at the first one, process safety culture. Let's look at process safety culture and look at how can we actually improve and, and enhance the safety culture within any organization, be it your organization or any of your colleagues' organizations or in, within the industry or where you're working uh, in, in the region where you're working in as well. Process safety culture really drives on a combination of actually having group values and behaviors to actually determine the way how process safety is managed and how committed an organization is towards process safety. Yep. So if you look at this, it's like uh, you are walking the talk. You can't just be about saying it and not following it. It's creating a culture where everyone feels 
responsible towards driving the same type of message across the entire organization from the CEO all the way down to the operator. Yeah. So there are five elements that forms under process safety culture, which is on leadership commitment and responsibilities being one, identification and compliance with legislation, then looking at employee selection and competency, workforce involvement, and then communication with stakeholders. So we're going to be looking at some of the key areas under process safety culture, right? And the first thing we really want to be looking at is how and how and what is the process safety culture within your organization or within any organization, right? Because process safety and culture is really very much influenced by people's attitudes, people's attitudes, people's behavior, and this is led by management, right? Usually it's the leaders who set the tone, set the, set the way, and everyone follows that. And it's based on very much shared beliefs and attitudes, but most importantly, it's very slow to change. It's not something that you can change very quickly. Uh, a good culture takes a long time to develop. It's actually like the picture we're showing you, break at a time, right? And one way to actually assess what is the culture within your organization is to do a survey. You can do a climate survey, to basically get a baseline of the culture within your organization and then look into how you want to actually improve and, and, uh, and identify the gaps and also to see how you can actually address those gaps in order to improve the overall process safety culture within your organization. So this is something that you can do. Uh, uh, we have worked with a company called SafeMap and, and they have actually developed a process safety, uh, a safety culture survey, which helps to understand employees' perceptions and attitudes towards safety. And by doing this, you will already know where your baseline of your process safety culture within your organization, right? You can see where the issues are, where the gaps are in terms of culture and performance. Then you can start looking towards uh, developing a plan for future improvements. So this is quite important. And we are beginning now to look more and more into uh, behaviors uh, and people's attitudes. and really trying to address culture as, as a starting point of actually increasing and enhancing and improving process safety within any organization. Some of the things that you want to look at is you want to be able to really uh, really start looking from a, a, from a leadership and management point of view about how you want to drive a good culture. So some of the elements what we've listed here is more like the leadership and management team really needs to actually clearly define roles and responsibilities for what everyone is doing. So it becomes clear what people are expected to do of them, right? So what you want to be looking at is from a leadership perspective is a clear establishment of what are the policies, what are the goals, uh, what is the process safety uh, policy within the organization? Then to set targets, to set HSC and process safety performance targets so that you can actually drive towards meeting and improving your organization's overall process safety culture, process safety uh, performance in order to meet those targets. And in order to do that, you then need to have the right kind of structure and the right kind of resources in order to achieve that, right? Because there's no point for the leadership team and management people to set all these goals set very nice policies, set targets, but then they don't give people the, the ability to be able to make the change. They don't give you the structure, they don't give you the time, they don't give you the people that you need in order to achieve the targets. So that's also very important. So these are critical areas where the leadership team and management people actually have to drive towards. And then provide perspectives because they have to provide perspective of running a business against all the priorities. So this is quite important. Next is key thing that you have to look from a culture is to make sure that you are actually in compliance with all your legislation and you adhere to all the standards which you have already defined within your organization. So you must make sure that all your legislation and standards that you are, you are using as part of operating your facilities, they have been identified, they are understood and complied with. So it's quite important to have this in place as part of driving and developing a good process safety culture. And another important aspect that you have to really look into driving a very good process safety culture 
is actually building competency within the workforce. So you really have to start looking at developing a structure in terms of an organization where you have the right people working in the right roles, but you can do that only once you've defined what the roles and responsibilities are, then actually uh, identify suitable people with the correct knowledge and experience, able to meet all the requirements for that role, and then by training, providing training in order for them to build the skill sets and the capability to complete the tasks that are given. So this is what you call the competency development and competency assurance program. That's something that is normally driven by the HR within any organization with input coming from the technical people as well. Yeah. So key thing that you need to look at in order to develop a strong process safety culture. And lastly, uh, workforce involvement. Uh, you can't have a good, a strong process safety culture without workforce involvement. Managers themselves can never drive process safety culture. You, it, it's actually the entire organization and it has to actually have workforce engagement and involvement, right? Uh, very important thing is to make sure that the, the workforce feels engaged, feels consulted, feels involved in the process. Uh, one way to do this is you can actually set up a, uh, a safety committee, uh, safety committee within the, the workforce themselves and for management to actively and regularly engage with that safety committee to talk about issues, issues that the workforce, because sometimes the workforce, the operators know about the issues better than the managers. So it's important to actually uh, drive that in order for the workforce to be able to express themselves to management and look at how issues can be addressed better as well. Yeah. Uh, another thing what management also can do is, is to do this coin this term is the Gamba safety walks where management can be, or rather should uh, be undertaking regular walks, regular visits out to the plant and to meet the workforce and engage with the workforce to communicate, to understand the issues faced by the workforce in order to make the task safer for them and also easier for them. So these are the key things that we think is important for any organization to actually start looking into in, towards developing a, a robust and strong process safety culture within the organization, which in turn will help uh, with the PSM implementation. Okay, that's on a little bit about the process safety culture. Uh, the next pillar is on identifying and assessing risk. What we're looking at from this perspective is there are two elements, which is understanding what are the specific hazards and risks that you're dealing with and the documentation uh, where you can actually use in order to actually manage those hazards, right? So if you think about it, this pillar is actually quite essential because you can't actually address and manage any of the hazards and risks if you don't know what they are. So it's very important to, at the onset, to clearly identify what are the hazards that are, that are present within your facility. And then from that, look at actually how are you going to be managing those hazards. Key areas within this pillar that what we think should be considered uh, is making sure that you have a robust process for identification and assessing of risks. And it has to be a process that systematically identifies assesses and appropriately manages the risks arising from your operations. So how would you do this? You can do this by actually looking at a qualitative method uh, where you're looking at, you know, uh, hazards or doing your hazards, where you can do your bow ties, your formicas, or you can do a more simplified type of quantitative where your low power, your silk comes in, or more quantitative method where you use your quantitative risk assessment where you're looking at a combination of fall tree, event tree, uh, probabilities in order to assess those risks quantitatively. Uh, give you an example, very good thing that you should really be looking and a lot of organizations these days are looking within their facilities is developing uh, bow ties. So you first, from your hazard, identify all the major accident hazards which are relating to process safety. And then from that, you develop your bow ties and the bow ties are more like a pictorial view of your, what you've identified as it, looking at your major accident hazard. And from that, on the left-hand side, you're looking at all the threats that can result in a major accident hazards. 
and what are the preventive barriers that you can have in place. So these are the elimination and prevention side. And then on the right-hand side is really more on if the event becomes a reality, if the major accident has become a reality, what are the consequences? It could be a fine explosion, for example. It can be acid damage, for example. And from that, you can look at all the recovery measures and this become the control and mitigation type of barriers in place as well. Yeah. Important to remember when you're looking at identification of hazards and looking at how to control and manage your hazards and risk, you want to look at the hierarchy of hazard management and how to control it. So if you look at it in a way, elimination is better than prevention, prevention is better than control, control is better than mitigation, mitigation is better than recovery. So if you can eliminate the hazard in the first place or prevent it from occurring in the first place, it is so much better than when it occurs, then you're trying to control and mitigate and recover, right? So that's why the bow tie actually helps you because on the left-hand side, you're looking at elimination and prevention, whereas the right-hand side, you're looking more on the control and recovery measures. So just remember this, this is very important. And the increased effectiveness actually is a lot better on the elimination and prevention as opposed to the recovery side. Uh, another important thing besides actually having the techniques and the tools in order to identify assess risk, you need to make sure your process safety information is current and up to date. Too many companies actually have, uh, are lacking behind in actually making sure their documentation and their process safety information is actually up to date. And what I mean by process safety information is like your PNIDs, your procedures, they all need to be up to date. And, and sometimes I appreciate it, it's hard to keep it always up to date because uh, uh, up to date because it's actually quite difficult sometimes in order to, because you're doing a lot of modifications, uh, you are doing a lot of MOCs over the years. So there is a lag before uh, documents become actually, what do you call it, uh, documents get updated correctly in, in line with our operations. But it's important to actually drive and, and strive towards actually trying to keep your PNIDs and all your documentation as, as up to date as you can, because that's what's being used in day to day operations. So imagine if your PNIDs are outdated and you're actually asking an operator to go and change out a valve where actually he's looking at a PNID that's outdated and then he's trying to do lockout and tagouts and actually trying to isolate something. And that's actually a recipe for disaster. So keeping your process safety information actually up to date and current is actually quite essential as part of actually uh, process safety uh, implementation. So just bear that in mind as well. Okay, next one is, I think we're moving towards managing risk and this is uh, the, the largest, largest pillar with the most elements and quite a number of uh, elements, 11 elements, as I mentioned, going from you know, operating manuals to standards and practices, to MOCs, to emergency preparedness, uh, inspection and maintenance, and so forth. So there are quite a number of elements that are essential, and most organizations have got this. It's, it's, it's more of a, uh, a matter of actually in what level of detail they have actually implemented these this, uh, elements within the organization. For us, what we think are key areas, to be to to ensure or start in order to ensure there is an effective PSM implementation within any organization. One thing is to start looking at your operating manuals and procedures. You need to make sure that you know your operating manuals and procedures they are reliable, they are available to people, they are accurate, up to date, understood, and continuously used. Uh, I've seen lots of operating manuals and procedures that are this thick. Um, very complicated, very hard to read, no one uses them. And that's not the purpose of why you need to have actually good operating management procedures. You want people to be able to use them and use them correctly. Uh, another important thing is all about handovers. Uh, too many times, if you look at historical information, a lot of incidents have occurred because one of the precursors has been uh, ineffective handovers between different shifts and different groups. So having good uh, monitoring of, uh, of your process conditions and operating conditions, uh, recording them correctly within your handover notes, and then doing an effective handover is actually quite important as part of managing those risks and managing those hazards. Then we we'll move on to MOC, uh, management of change, 
uh, forms when you are making a change to your process, where you're making a, a change or modification to an existing process where you're changing the original intent of its operations and you are changing maybe equipment. And it's important to go through the management of change process so that you are not introducing new risk or additional hazards as part of that modification. You need to make sure that the risk arising from the change that you're planning to implement, they have been identified, assessed, and, and properly managed as well. Uh, types of types of actually what we would class as management of change, a change of process we consider as management, uh, management of change. So if you are changing set points, and some organizations don't really do this, but we feel it's actually quite important and reputable operators really do this. When you're changing set points, set points for longer term, you should really go through a, a MOC. So it's captured and then all the documents are updated accordingly as well. A change of plan is normal. Most people will do this. Uh, change in organization normally is managed by HR and then change of control systems as well. So these are examples really of uh, areas within changes where uh, management of change process, management of change uh, system should be actually be looking into these areas. Yeah. Uh, the next one is about operational readiness. Uh, this is becoming more and more important now. Uh, this is normally, uh, for a lot of operators, some of you may know this as a pre-startup safety reviews, where if you're commissioning a new plant, a new equipment, or you're making a modification and restarting the plant, or you've had a shutdown and then you're restarting the facility, uh, more and more operators now are looking at actually doing a, a pre-startup safety review. Now, I appreciate if you're starting a brand new plant, it will be very significant. Uh, but if you're not doing a brand new plant, you're doing a smaller type of modification, then that uh, modification, that pre-startup safety review becomes a lot smaller and a lot less. And you can do it quite quickly within, within the operations teams themselves. Uh, inspection, testing, and maintenance is something that uh, people are looking and should be looked at in a lot more detail going forward, and especially with uh, existing operations. You want to be looking at inspection from three, three perspectives, where you're looking at visual checks, you are doing functional checks, functional testing, you're testing valves, maybe you're checking valves, whether they're closing and opening. Uh, it's quite important to do that. And, and you build performance standards for those systems where you are actually making sure that those systems are being tested regularly. Right? Uh, some countries, some operators also have a third party verification, uh, verification party that actually comes in and ensures that actually what you say you'll be doing you are doing them correctly. And, and their purpose is to help you identify gaps in order for you to close those gaps. Uh, as part of actually doing your inspection and maintenance, you want to be focusing a lot more on your safety critical equipment. Uh, you can do this and you can identify what are your barriers or equipment that are classed as safety critical uh, forming from, from the bow tie developments. When you look at the bow ties, you've defined your barriers. And from that, you can actually assess what are the barriers that should be classed as safety critical. And based on that, you should be managing those barriers effectively because these are the layers of protection that you have that prevents any of the threats, if you remember from the bow ties, from becoming a major accident hazard that eventually reads, uh, results in a consequence. So these are quite important things for you to look at. Uh, and another thing that obviously you know, it's all about work control and this comes under the permit to work. So I'll go through this very quickly in order to save some time. And lastly, about emergency preparedness. Uh, any organization really needs to look at actually how the organization is prepared to handle any potential emergencies. So you need to have the right uh, organization structure in place, the right plan in place, the right procedures in place, and also the right kind of uh, equipment that you have in order to use to manage those emergency situations. Uh, these are typical type of uh, just some examples that you have in terms of our emergency response organization. And the type of tiers usually will have three tiers that you look at, right? Uh, I appreciate that I'm taking a bit longer. So just, uh, just the last few slides. The last pillar is looking at review and improve, which is more about uh, continuous improvement in order to actually 
improve process safety performance and performance of HSE within your organization. Key things that you want to be looking at is always be doing incident uh, reporting and investigation so that you actually are identifying root causes that you can actually address and ensure there is no reoccurrence of such incidents in the future. And of course, you also want to do regular reviews and audits to make sure that your PSM framework or your HSE performance and your targets that you set earlier that you are actually trying to meet and, and continuously strive towards meeting those targets. And lastly, you want to set some process safety KPIs. So what is process safety KPIs? You're looking at things coming from the OGP standards. You're looking at the four tiers and trying to drive some lead, leading and lagging indicators. So these are the type of things that you should be implementing in order to actually have a clear ways of actually assessing your process safety performance and how you can improve your process safety performance within your organization. Okay, moving down the questions then. I will stop sharing and then we can ask questions. Yeah, it's a big, it's a very big topic actually. It is. Uh, right? Yeah, but for an overview, I think those uh, those fifty minutes or forty five minutes are okay. Uh, just give us an overview of the topic. But uh, PSM is a very big one, <laughs> and maybe need so many sessions. Uh, so all the participants, the different ends can adopt this uh, PSM into the, our systems. But uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Mike. I, I agree with you. I think it, it is a robust and it's a big one, but you know, I hope from this presentation, even though there are a lot of things to, to consider, you will take some, some key points you know, and sometimes maybe uh, just develop it as building blocks. You, you, sometimes it's too difficult to do all at once, but maybe you can start with some of the elements first and slowly, gradually, plan towards you know some of the different elements being implemented at different times then eventually you reach towards your equilibrium if you've got a robust uh, process safety management implementation within your company hello yes yeah hello yeah can you hear me yes manga no hello Who's yeah, that? Is, uh, yes mr proben uh, this yes. is uh, mark watch yeah yeah, um, uh, thank you so much for a very wonderful presentation and a very educative topics. Thank uh, you. Yeah, and on my part, actually, I would like to know exactly what the difference between process safety and occupational safety. And the second part to that will be what are the process safety metrics that you could recommend to any organizations? Sure, Thank so you. not a problem at all. Uh, so to answer your first question, the difference between process safety and occupational safety, as I mentioned before, uh, examples of occupational safety are slip trips and falls, falling from height, which affects one person. And they are normally high frequency because it happens a lot, but low consequence, right? Most likely what will happen is you might injure yourself or break your hand or break your leg, but it will, in most cases, not result in a fatality. Okay. And occupational safety is really very much managed by training and procedures. Process safety, on the other hand, is actually the events that are low frequency, but high consequence. So if you think of a blowout, fire and explosion, toxic gas release, uh, if it's offshore environment, ship collision. These are things that don't happen very often, but when they happen, they actually can affect multiple people. So you can have multiple injuries, multiple fatalities, significant uh, damage to the asset, significant environmental damage. So that's the difference between occupational safety and processing. Does that answer your first question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Perfect. Your second question, you're asking about a matrix. Uh, yes, can you uh, clarify process what you mean matrix. by a matrix? Uh, in a, uh, okay, what are the keys, uh, metrics that you, you could judge an organization whether it is following a proper process safety? Uh, there's various ways. Uh, one of the ways of knowing how you are in, 
actually how you're performing from a process safety point of view is to apply the process safety KPIs, the one that I mentioned right at the end, where you're looking at leading and lagging indicators. And then you are, you are assessing your performance on a quarterly basis, looking at those uh, lead, leading and lagging indicators. And you do this year end, year off, year end, at every year, and then you start looking at actually better statistics and the statistics will give you indication that you are actually performing a lot better from a process safety point of view. However, I say that, but that's purely from a statistical point of view. The element of culture is also very important because as you drive the culture and become more robust in process safety and have a very robust process safety culture within your organization, uh, this will actually help you with your statistics as well. So I think you have to work on it on both sides. Okay, in uh, okay, for other parts of the question in coming to management of the change. Yes. So, yes, uh, in aspect of the change, what is, uh, how could you do a design uh, integrity of, uh, for a process that is already established? And so how do you go about the management of change for a um, mechanical okay. device that's already been uh, installed or already implemented? So, you know, management of kid change comes about when you're operating a facility or a plant. And for example, you need to now bypass a particular section because the pump is no longer working and you, or you don't need the pump anymore, right? So you actually have to come up with a design of that bypass. You then have to actually assess it from an engineering and safety perspective and make sure that all the hazards that are associated with that, you have identified and you're not introducing any new risk as a result of that change. You go through a management of change process. You go through the relevant people that need to review that so that all the approvals are actually uh, received. All the paperwork is done. The assessment of risk is done. The engineering is completed. And only then you release the work pack for it to be constructed and the MOC to be uh, changed up. Does that answer your question? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Very welcome. Uh, MOC, there's the, you know, you can, you can, there are a lot of softwares out there. There's, there's a lot of uh, information already available on the internet. A lot, you can easily find out a typical MOC process that you can adopt within any organization. So uh, most organizations will already have an MOC process. If not, uh, there is readily available MOC processes that is, uh, developed by the industry as well. But normally companies would do this specific for themselves because they would like to fine tune based on the organization structure that they have. Thank you. You're very welcome. Uh, okay, questions? once again. Yes, Mike. Uh, yes, uh, on the presentation, you spoke on uh, some certifications and I captured one uh, as Buta or something. Uh, could you tell us, uh, you were telling about uh, some Buta or Buta certification or something. I didn't capture well, but uh, if there are any certifications to, uh, to do with PSM, uh, you can a bit highlight on, uh, on this matter. Uh, certification in terms of... Was that right in the beginning of the presentation? Yeah, you even re referred to your company. Okay. Synergy. Yeah, so I think what we were talking about is doing some training, right? Or were you talking about me personally about the professional process safety certification? Yeah, for I've captured in the into introduction, yep. uh, there's some certificate you call, it's called BUTA or it's a center. For yeah, I think the bow, kind of... the bow tie, I think he, he's mentioned. Uh, about the okay, bow... okay, the, okay, the bow tie one, right. So the bow tie is actually a software. No, the bow tie is the, is a, ah, it's software, huh? okay. Right, correct. So the bow tie is a software, uh, bow tie XP is a software and it uses the bow tie method that you can then assess really your, 
process safety related hazards or major accident hazards like fire and explosion, loss of containment, for example, uh, structure failure, for example. And then from that, you can start looking at what are the causes that can result in that particular major accident hazard from occurring in the first place. So you're looking at corrosion, uh, human errors, you can be looking at external impact, you can look at internal corrosion. So these are the type of threats that can result in the major accident hazard. And then you start identifying what are the barriers you have in place to prevent it from occurring. Yeah. So similarly, uh, if you have the major accident hazard, on the right-hand side will be what are the consequences. You can have fine explosion. If you have an ignition, you can have acid damage. And from that, what kind of recovery measures that you have in place. So you will have fire and gas detection. You can have a shutdown and isolation or shutdown and blowdown. You have your fire water system and so forth. So it's a very nice pictorial way of showing your major accident hazards. What are the threats that can result in the major accident hazard or the process safety event? The consequences when you have the process safety event and all the barriers that you have within your organization, be it hardware or software, and how you manage those hazards. Yeah, so I, I used to know it as a Victoria, like you said, but yes. uh, have they developed it into a software now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been going on for a number of years now. Yes. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. You're very welcome. So uh, you just have to, just go, if you were to search for CGE, uh, CGE is the company that developed Bowtie, or just type in Bowtie XP on the internet and you'll be able to get more information. I'll, I'll share it with the, the SPE guys as well so that you, you know, they can disseminate this information to yourselves. Would that be okay, uh, Adam Zemanga? Hello. Yes. Hello. Yeah, Mr. Provence, uh, uh, I actually really like the slide where you talk about the overview of some of major incident in the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, accident that's occurring there. Uh, just last week, I think it's about a week ago, and I, I understand that you have some project in Nigeria. There's uh, uh, an incident that occurred offshore in Nigeria. So would you please uh, educate us what are the causes and what could be lesson learned and recommendation from that incident? Uh, I think this is one of the latest incident that occurred uh, all right. just so offshore it, in Nigeria last week. It, yeah. It is. So it is, no, since it's happened only quite recently, uh, it's very hard to achieve what were the real causes of it. Uh, so we'll need to wait for the incident investigation to conclude and what are the findings. I think this will be uh, important for the industry for us to actually look at the incident investigation and the findings in order for other similar organizations or any organization for that matter to see what are the findings, what were the root causes and see how those, those findings and that lessons learned can be implemented within uh, each one of your organization. So to answer your question, it's a bit too early to tell actually what, what has occurred then. So I would, I would wait until the, at least the preliminary incident investigation is concluded. All right, thanks. A bit too early, a bit too early to ask that question right now, to be honest. Okay, no problem. Any other questions? I'm happy to, you know, there are there are no there are no bad questions. Just ask any questions that come to your mind, not a problem. We if we can answer them, we'll be happy to answer them. I would like to thank everyone. Thank you again for attending this presentation. And thank you to the SP Juba section for arranging this. I, I am more than happy to do more presentations for yourselves and to your members in the future on any topics that you may think of. Thank you, Mr. Fuvan. Thank you for taking your time also to provide this valuable presentation. I hope uh, the members and 
the the PE team at the depot also benefited from it. I actually invited the 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 PNF, the process and facilities team yesterday to join, but I'm not sure if we have some of them around here. So because this is uh, beneficial to both the the engineering team and uh, the the facilities team as well. So thank you, yeah, for taking your time, and uh, hopefully we can arrange for more meetings like this. Uh, in a more specific topic, like a uh, more narrow one, so that now we go to a specific uh, topic or a specific skill for the members and for the working class, yeah? So Absolutely, no problem at all, Manga. I'd be more than happy. Just let us know if there's a topic that of interest to the members, uh, and if it is within the realms of what we can do, we will definitely be more than willing and happy to share with the members. Definitely, definitely. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care and have a good day.